Hello everyone. Are you guys excited? We are going to take today small journey of knowledge. I'm really excited to talk to you. I myself certified pelvic floor physiotherapist, Pranjali Khairmode, representing Insta Physical Therapy. So I'm going to talk about this least talked about, but most curiosity generated topic pelvic floor rehabilitation or pelvic floor treatment for incontinence. So with the numerous years of experience and uh, greatest outcome treating, dealing with this kind of condition, I actually got interested to talk to people, you know, just let them, let them know more, let them find out what can they do to participate themselves to take control of this. So this topic interests me always. I'm a neurophysiotherapist, but this topic actually interested me. How can it connect brain to the base? Isn't it, isn't it exciting? So brain is like you are neurophysiotherapy and the pelvic floor physiotherapy, trying to combine everything. This topic actually, uh, I'm going to share my slides here. has a lot of connection to the brain. That's why I think I got interested to talk about it. Um, so the, this topic has a lot of stigmas, a lot of embarrassment, a lot of questions and mysteries attached to it. So I like to talk about it more so that people uh, get more knowledge of this. So our pelvic floor physiotherapy for incontinence. This looks so beautiful, like butterfly, open butterfly, you know, it has to be flourishing. It has to be, it's very delicate. It's very important. And it has this beautiful capacity to give birth, you know, um, and then sexuality. The whole objective of this workshop is to know how common it is. It's not just one person it is affecting. It's not just me. Why is it happening? Can anything be changed? And what are the available solutions? Where can I go? What do I find out? So what is incontinence? Incontinence is involuntary leakage or uncontrolled voiding of the urine or feces. That means peeing or pooping. It goes uncontrolled. So yesterday I was just talking to my bunch of friends that uh, tomorrow I'm going to present something and they're like, uh, so what's your topic? And uh, so they're like, um, what is pelvic floor or what is incontinence? So I said that I'm a pelvic floor physiotherapist. I deal with this kind of clients. And they said that, oh, are you going to talk about how to stop the leakage? And I said, yes. And they said that definitely you're going to talk about pelvic floor lockdown. <laughs> it's so appropriate in this current situation. Sitting at home, we are talking about such vital issue. So in my practice and otherwise, when I talk to public, I have un undergone so many misconceptions. I have heard there are so many misconceptions, so many, um, different thoughts process about it. The myths, I would like to share some myths which I've heard. Since childhood or when like I, I heard speaking my mother about it, I heard speaking my grandparents about it, that bladder leakage is normal and part of aging and in the post-pregnancy. False. Only women have bladder leakage. Surgery is the only option for pelvic organ prolapse. Erectile dysfunction, constipation, vaginal pain during the intercourse is normal and doesn't require any special attention. False. So what is reality? Even men has uh, incontinence. Children also suffers, suffer from for this same. So what is the fact? 
what i have undergone in my practice pelvic floor physiotherapy really works so i'm going to talk about pelvic floor physiotherapy in a while i'll educate you about this hey what is pelvic floor so i'll just show you here so if you can see the pelvic floor is like a sling of muscle starting from the front bone to the back coccyx your tailbone and it actually goes like a trampoline from side to side of your hip bones like your sit bones so let me show you here so this looks like this at your bottom your flank bones are here your spine is in the back the front will be your abdominal muscles and down there the base which i was talking about is uh, your pelvic floor starting from front to back and side to side and it is nicely nicely intervening muscles you know they actually very nicely into shapes between each other and they have different openings the front opening is for peeing purpose then there is opening in females vagina and the back opening is for fecal matter passage okay that's your anus or rectum so this is like nicely if you see inside there are different muscles intervening each other and they are nicely congruent to each other like this okay in the pelvic area we have different organs like front is bladder then your uterus and then your rectum and anus so let me share a slide again yeah so here it is as we have already seen okay the function as i have already spoke, spoken about it supports the abdominal and the uh, visceral contents and the pelvic organs then there is a sphincter bladder bowel it stabilizes the abdominal and pelvic girdle muscles there are a lot of attachment of the muscles uh, in the front from the flank bone and there is a lot of attachment in the back also so the lower spine i take into consideration into the pelvic zone and it has a some pump activities that means a lot of uh, pumping motion is happening because a lot of great vessels is attached at the pelvic area it is a uh, intersection between your upper body and the legs so whatever uh, um, the vessels are pumping the blood they are actually present there so the important vascular function is happening always start connecting from the brain to the base you know so let's uh, talk about brain a little bit later let's talk let's see this thoracic cavity abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity how you can imagine this is like a shape of balloon it's like a inflated balloon what happens is like any kind of different um pressure activity happening in the thoracic area so intra thoracic pressure intra abdominal pressure and intra pelvic pressure impacts on each other when uh, inflate imagine a inflated balloon if you squeeze it from one side the pressure is going to transmit to the other side so it is going to affect so how nicely coordinated they have to function we can understand by this diagram so that's why i always say that you know breathe easy or you should not have constipation or you know abdominal uh, increase abdominal pressure activity which i'll be talking in a while so what what are the type of dysfunctions pelvic can have so i generally categorize them into two uh, very major um, categories right so one is hypotonic and one is hypertonic so hypotonic means like laxity or doesn't have good tone or doesn't have good muscle um activity 
And hypertonic is again, it's very tight, constrained, and uh, again, not good function. So whenever the muscles are tight, they are also weak, but weak muscles are ill-coordinated, right? So hypotonic, hypotonicity is a major cause of incontinence. And then the pelvic organ prolapse. In hypertonic pelvic floor muscles, what happens is like, because it's so tight, there could be multiple uh, trigger points, uh, multiple uh, tender points. And there are high chances of infection because the blood flow is not good and the area is quite constrained. It's not breathing well. And again, the overall uh, benign tightness, people who are sedentary, people who have restricted mobility, pe people who cannot, uh, or wheelchair bound or something. Or, so those, mu those muscles can be really tight and there is no good function or good breathing or good circulation, good neurological activities are happening. So th those can be categorized into this. What are the other dysfunctions? So incontinence, what we are focusing today. Pelvic pain, constipation, organ prolapse are the different variety of dysfunction, which maybe next time we can talk about. Uh, talk about. So incontinence. So I'm actually seeing there are different risk factors Depending upon the age, as the age progresses, one out of three women has a risk of uh, having urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence. Pregnancy and the childbirth, one in four women goes through this. Lifestyle and behavior, mod uh, behavior like obesity, limited physical activity, smoking. Health conditions like stroke, diabetes, neurological problems. So diabetes can increase the intravesical pressure and then uh, the fluid retention. So that can cause urgency kind of a, uh, incontinence. Neurological problems like mus this, this uh, neurological problems can cause muscle weakness and uh, restricted mobility. So that can cause incontinence or the incoordination of the muscles overall. Problems of urinating and having bowel movement. Like if you have undergone any kind of cesarean section, it's a pelvic surgery, then you have undergone any kind of abdominal structures. Or, so any kind of surgery which is in a lower abdominal region can impact your bladder bowel function as well. So this is a funny main I have uh, just seen recently. So they are asking you to hold. Lower urinary tract. Just in brief, I will go through this um, in a female pelvic area and a male urinary tract, right? So female urinary tract is uh, kind of like this is a bladder and there is a bladder neck, then urethra. So the upper part, the proximal urethra and the uh, distal urethra. So the down portion, if you can see the, this kind of a sling muscle, which is attached to the pelvic floor. So external urethral, uh, urethral sphincter, it is called as the outside portion of the peeing point is actually nicely held by this pelvic floor muscles. Um, this is called as a uh, levator ani muscle. And actually you imagine that if that muscle goes dysfunctional, then you will lose control over your urine or this bladder is irritated. The bladder is very sensitive. It has a lot of neurons activating. So anything which is irritating the bladder constantly, it can cause urges. It, uh, so the capacity of the bladder to inflate uh, decreases. So that can impact. But in male, this is, the urethra is quite longer than the female. So it is covered at the base of the neck of the bladder, there is a prostate gland. And in male, the, uh, the incontinence actually can occur because of the prostatitis or infection or inflammation of the prostate. Because it's right at the base here and uh, that infection or inflammation can cause the constriction or a choking 
mechanism uh, around this bladder neck and it can constantly irritate or any kind of tightness the male hip and uh, the pelvic area is generally more tighter than the females uh, then you really need to work out with that um, unless they are working out like with the a uh, lot of sedentary job or you know uh, otherwise also because of the testosterone itself there could be uh, existing tightness around that area so micturition re reflex means how what happens when you want to pee so it's kind of a reflex in the spinal cord and it goes to the base of the uh, base of the brain and the intersection between the spinal cord and the base of the brain it this diagrams looks pretty complicated right don't even bother because i know that the the diagram it's not for everyone that's for a medical purpose but again if you go back and see that this bladder is supplied by a lot of nerves in the spinal this is a spinal cord and lot of nerves from the spinal cord uh, they are innervating this bladder so and those nerves are actually present in your back so this outflow is actually coming from the back so anyone who has like lower back pain extreme lower back pain or in any kind of like prolapse into vertebral disc can affect your bladder function as well that's what i try i'm trying to uh, point out so that's that's one of the thing but it's just not the spinal cord you know it can it has a higher brain function involved as well so what happens when you want to pee just don't go into complication you know i like to put it into the simple words like it has either you will pee or you won't pee so what happens so when you feel like peeing uh immediately the signal goes into the spinal cord and either first of all what happens is like your muscles wants to relax you the spinal uh, nerve comes in and wants to relax it first so that the capacity of the bladder increases generally at the um, capacity of 300 ml 150 to 300 ml you will feel like you want to go pee but not necessarily your capacity you can increase the detrusor muscle or the the flexible muscles of your bladder can actually store a lot of urine before you can find a socially acceptable place to go to washroom so you can store the urine or you pee so uh, for storage purpose i actually would like to um, explain you that the sympathetic nervous system plays a major role in it and then why i have put stress because stress and sympathetic system are so much correlated right so when you are stressed out when you are nervous you want to what happens is like there is a inhibition for the pee and you store a lot of urine inside right or noradrenaline this is a hormone actually or it's a bio sorry it's a biochemical which is generated when you are quite stressed and um, that can cause a lot of storage in the urine so you're not able to pee or hesitancy when you go pee i'm not able to pee properly because the the function the the smoothness of the activity is not happening and you contract a lot of contraction happens in the down below like pelvic floor muscles so they they become contracted so you are not able to pee easily for the peeing you need a parasympathetic that means a relaxation and i always like to call it as like happy you know whenever you are happy it's easy for you it's so much relax out there that the normal coordination of the synchronicity happens very well you know and then dopamine endorphin and the serotonin is are other neurotransmitters or they are the biochemicals in your body they get released when you are happy or when you are like relaxed or when you are just enjoying or you know so basically this this is so much correlated when you are relaxed and when you are like not under any nervous uh, you know high high point you can be easily or it's well coordinated i mean okay so these are the two things and then again the maturation schema 
don't even bother again going into so much of complications. What I really wanted to focus here is forebrain. I, if you're reading in the center, there is a forebrain which actually modulates everything. So it's like a regulation, you know. So forebrain is situated in the front lobe of your brain, you know, and it has a maturation center or a continent center. So it generally decides the, it's a higher center. It's like a higher boss, right? So whatever is happening in down below is very, very, very uh, reflexively. So you, a small amount of urine comes and you feel like peeing, but again, you, not necessarily you go pee. So you can actually relax yourself and deflate the bladder. You can store more urine and then you find a socially acceptable place, socially acceptable environment at the right time to go pee, you know? So if you can hold it for uh, till then, the brain actually can decide it. So brain actually sends the signal to this different areas, either micturation means like peeing point, like go pee or do not go pee and hold on to urine. So it actually controls the pelvic floor muscles. Th those muscles are in voluntary co uh, coordination or voluntarily controlled. So you have total control over it, right? What if you start losing the control? So this is kind of a, a nice mnemonic which I have encountered. Um, so delirium. Delirium means confusion, you know, so it's a diaper. Infection, okay, any kind of infection can cause irritation, inflammation, and a lot of activity of the bladder. Atrophic vaginitis, that means when the estrogen level goes down in females after um, uh, menopause, then it can cause a lot of uh, tightness or irritation or you know, my facial structures or trigger points. Uh, by pharmaceutical, that means some of the drugs or some of the medicines uh, can cause uh, incontinence or uh, lack of uh, coordination, including alcohol, caffeine, artificial sweetness. Okay, so some of them are, like, uh, are uh, bladder irritant substance. So you need to find out if you're ingesting that. And then excess, excess uh, excretion. In case of diabetes, you know, you want to pee a lot or nocturia. That means you get up in the night and uh, go visit washroom quite often, even when you're stressed, you know, or, you know, next day you have exam or something. Um, restricted mobility, as I explained, wheelchair bound patients, neurologically affected of stool, stool impaction. That means somebody who's quite a lot of constipated uh, down there, there is like a constant irritation to this, uh, the passage of pee outflow. The types of urinary incontinence are stress when you increase intra-abdominal pressure. That means coughing, sneezing, laughing, jumping, activities. Urge incontinence is where you all constantly feel like urgency, like I want to go pee, I want to go pee. So yeah, with less amount of uh, urine storage also, you can like inhibit that sensation out there. It, it, it can, again, um, can be uh, extra... Um, sensations or extra activity of the brain or it, it's extra activity of your bladder itself. Then overactive bladder. Overactive bladder can be found more in male clients and uh, obviously because of the, as I explained earlier, prostatitis or any kind of inflammation. Functional is obviously when you can't, uh, you have a restricted mobility, you cannot make it to washroom on time and overflow when you're just dribbling you small amount of urine comes it's because of the excessive weakness of the level for it just doesn't hold down there it just constantly the urine comes and you pee urine comes and you pee you know urine in the bladder i mean and transient can be like combination of any other factors incontinence is just explained in a diagrammatic form that what happens in the bladder the bladder storage and you know uh, how the pelvic floor muscles can act to uh, just hold on to the urine. Okay, so I'm not actually mainly focusing on the fecal incontinence that is like passing out stools without your control. Um, that is one of the topic to talk about. It is found, it's not much talked about, uh, but yes, pelvic floor physiotherapy can help to diagnose and treat that kind of issues. It has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, 
again prevalent prevalence in the society mm, constipated people can be you know taken under uh, the umbrella of pelvic floor um, dysfunction or the pelvic floor rehabilitation can help them so the mass movement happens in the last part of the colon that is your gastric uh, sorry the descending colon and then this is a sigmoid colon where uh, the fecal matter comes in stores and this is a last part which is rectum and the opening at the down below is anus so it's well coordinated in general so whenever the fecal matter comes in gets stored in the rectum you feel to go poop but again socially acceptable place you find that out and then you open the anus but what if the anus is very tight what if your hip area is um, inflamed tight dysfunctional um, it's always tight and it's always hyper irritated or something the fecal matter will not pass very easily so again as i have explained earlier it's a part of pelvic floor dysfunction and uh, yeah we can uh, actually deal with it successfully so different physiological stresses on the pelvic floor it can be when you are nervous when you are anxious so all those things can actually affect your pelvic floor right um, as i have already explained that sympathetic and parasympathetic activity yes it does affect your neuronal outflow or you know the how much sensitive your bladder is or how much you are well coordinated to pee easily or poop easily right so one of the physiological stressor is pregnancy you know you are actually carrying a baby weight in your abdominal cavity and then it starts at the last trimester it starts descending down and it starts sitting in the pelvic area so a lot of compression can happen a lot of like it happens very gradually but again the bladder can take a toll on it and uh, the pelvic floor muscles actually at the last phase it effect effacement happened that means opening of this muscles the the hormones are secreted to just you know uh, release those uh, tight colla uh, collagen structures and you know the flexibility happens in the pelvic floor floor area to get prepared for delivering a baby in that context the pre existing weakness can cause a lot of trouble in there or what if you have like to totally tight pelvic floor then what happens is like the there is no great opening there is not well coordination and during the delivery you can um in the process of delivery you can actually tear tear this muscle so to prevent that you need the health of the pelvic floor which i always talk about the top pelvic floor hammock it's like if you see the ropes at the uh, uh, of the hammock which is tied to the tree this ropes are like imagine this collagen structures and then the ligaments and uh, this ligaments are actually holding this pelvic organs nicely into the pelvic area but what if those ligaments and the the fascia around it goes weak or the collagen fibers goes weak it can suddenly break down and you you know this this is kind of a prolapse and means like the pelvic organ can fall off from its original position it starts peak, peaking out from uh, the vagina so what do we do as a physiotherapist as a professional we actually have a good knowledge about anatomy physiology uh, nervous supply of uh, this different areas right so in a certification pelvic floor physiotherapy what we do here is we get uh, into details of or intricate detailing of this muscles so we exactly know which muscle is bothering you or what is asymmetry are there any trigger point are there any tender point so we we can come to know with a digital examination so we are certified into it and then there is this kind of example is like pat test uh, we come to know that one when person increases in top abdominal pressure how much pee is coming out uh, in routinely clinic we don't do this but again we can understand like how much or like if at all the urine is dribbling at different activities or we just take a detailed history you know so that's what we do like detailed history why important because we need to know that what kind of 
personality every every person is different so we never categorize pelvic uh, uh, sorry incontinent patient so every incontinent patient has his own graph so every uh, body has their own personality they have their own um, uh, like lifestyle you know so somebody uh, who is smoking or anybody has is their medical complications happening anybody has undergone surgery or um, somebody has a sedentary job so we need to go into the really detailing of how the person or what are the multifactorial things are impacting which is actually causing incontinence incontinence can never be present it's like one factor very rare but we have to correlate different areas which can hit the bladder and the the whole graph or whole peeing um, sentence peeing or pooping so detailed history is very very essential systematic assessment we go through right from the posture right from the breathing pattern then we assess um, the any kind of muscle weakness muscle tightness trigger point tender point or um, how the person is moving how is the gait um, what level of uh, activity the person is involved in um, exercise patterns or you know weight lifting patterns everything we have to assess um, so that's what we do specific diagnosis we have to come in, uh, into this specific diagnosis we need to find out what is exactly the cause or uh, is it a prolapse what grade of prolapse prolapse means like uh, dropping down the pelvic organs and how they're impacting are they inflamed or anything which is um, systematically systemic systemically bothering the person multifactorial correlation that's what we try to like connect the dots you know from here and there we actually make a graph of the person that okay this we have to look into it the the diet history the nutrition history the water content history you know everything is jotted down nicely so that you know that one person is dealt with that kind of paradigm and then can be you know reassessed comprehensive management plan yes we need to have comprehensive that means everything should be touched based on like the activity level so let's let's increase the activity level or how the person's personality is you know and if um, any anxiety pre existing anxiety is uh, um, present and what can we do to relieve that anxiety or what you know reverse way like when you exercise you feel happy you start releasing this uh, endorphin and dopamine to you know feel good so you it can go reverse as well you know sometimes we we start re reverse management that we start uh, dealing with you know numerous factors in the plan and then we see we retrospectively see we go back and see that how person is doing well a progressive increment in the fitness we cannot stick to only one fitness plan so we have to touch base on strength aspect we have to strength uh, based on how the posture is postural muscles or the stabilizers are acting or uh, the overall uh, fitness like aerobic functions like how much you know uh, hopping skipping jumping um, walking per day or you know treadmill or something so everything has to be touched based on and we actually go on to each step to assess the good result in this kind of uh, incontinent issue so our approach is uh, you know bladder training okay so bladder training obviously so when what happens is like actually brain controls the bladder but what if bladder has its own brain so you know bladder start taking control of you like but bladder starts telling you what to do and what not to do and like i have to go pee no matter what that's not even right you know i have um, actually encountered this uh, so many times uh, like when i was kid my mom used to tell me that hey we are going uh, to visit a relative why don't you go pee you know i um, i like we are traveling and after each uh, one hour uh, pause she used to tell me go pee like i don't even feel like peeing mom why are you telling me but it's kind of a detraining of the bladder you actually just in case uh going and peeing 
determines the activity of the bladder. You are actually uh, giving a cry, crying baby a toy each time it's crying. And you're not even training the bladder to expand and release the pressure so that there, there is less of uh, extra neuronal activity at the bladder. Then we need to uh, maintain, patient education is the first treatment what I believe uh, because once, once un somebody understands what is exactly going wrong with them, they start taking control of it. So they have their own education pattern that, okay, I'm anxious, okay, I'm not breathing well, or um, my muscles are weak. Now they exactly can make a graph of their life and they, they can actually uh, start dealing with all those factors and you know at the same time and then the good results happen. Bladder diary. So we actually ask them to uh, maintain a bladder diary to understand that what is their frequency, whether they're hesitant to go pee or are they peeing comfortably, uh, how much they're drinking fluid or water, what is the water intake, or whether they're having any kind of bladder irritants like coffee or anything, coffee, tea. So we can start associating with what is exactly causing those triggers and what is exactly, you know, uh, causing a problem in their peeing or pooping issues. Schedule voiding. Yes, we actually ask them to, um, this is kind of a treatment approach, you know. So schedule voiding is we are actually asking them to inhibit that sense, extra sensory outflow that, okay, you know, stop, don't listen to the bladder each time, you know. And then you train bladder slowly that you can take multiple breaks. Um, you, you should not go each hour. You can wait for a while one and after one and a half hour or something, you have to go pee. So your brain gets trained, right? And then your bladder gets trained. Improving diet, reducing bladder triggers. Yes, it's very much important uh, to avoid the extra triggers. So diet nutrition um, is touch base on. Exercises. What are the benefits of exercises or what do we do in the exercise section, you know? So breathing, you know, as I said, that balloon, you know, consider the example of the balloon when you're breathing well, the intrathoracic or inside chest, whatever the lung capacity is, you're actually smoothing that out. You're not deep breathing or your shallow breathers or whatever the breathing pattern is. It's going to impact your intra-abdominal pressure also, what is generated in your tummy. So, and then it will impact your pelvic floor function. So if you're uh, laughing, coughing, sneezing, um, you need to understand that what is exactly causing that outflow of urine, uh, why you're not able to control that. Uh, breathing can actually, synchronous breathing can uh, make it uh, the peeing issue easy. Circulation, you know, so it improves your circulation, overall circulation, you know, vascular supply and everything. Uh, relieves back pain when you exercise obviously the, and the back actually sympathetic outflow like the nerves are in the lumbar area in your lower back area and then uh, the nerve actually is um, the perineal or pudental nerve which is supplying the pelvic uh, floor muscles that are exactly present around your hips and buttocks so if you're sitting for a long period of time if you're not having good back support or something, it's going to cause a lot of irritation of these nerves and they are going to act up or they are going to have their own irritation. So yeah, we have to look into that posture correction, improving strength and of the tummy muscles and pelvic floor muscles. Yes, that's very much important. And I think everybody understands the strengthening part. So I need not even tell them that, you know, the, when you, when you're strong enough down there, you're going to pee easy or you, your control is going to be good because everybody knows that, but not the breathing. I, I didn't like in my uh, overall years of practice, uh, very less people have paid attention to the breathing part and, you know, uh, posture part. Aerobic fitness, everybody knows that when you, when you're fit enough, the muscle contraction and relaxation ability, like, you know, letting go ability is also better. So overall, you know, nice uh, flow of this muscles and coordination is so much required for having a good peeing or pooping pattern. Yes, we have already spoken about posture, maintenance of good posture, how beneficial it is, uh, especially around this pelvic area. 
So look into the spine, look into the uh, buttock area, look into the fitness of the hip area as well. The inner, the adductor muscles, the inner thigh muscles, if they are tight and uh, uh, dysfunctional, then a lot of pelvic floor issues are correlated with that. Researchers have already proven that. Um, as soon as you deliver a baby, you need to attend to your health as well. Many women forget to take care of themselves when they're recently delivered. So uh, their breastfeeding pattern, you know, the posture is maintained very well. They have a special hormone secreting. So when you're breastfeeding, actually you're healing yourself. So pay attention to the small details about that, how well you're attending to your health so that you can recover well. You have like six months time to recover very well, to get the suppleness of the pelvic floor muscles and to get the health of the pelvic floor muscles. So slowly and steadily, you have to pay attention to that. Uh, we actually give a lot of feedback that what's going wrong with their uh, fitness if they're not uh, attending to the posture and everything. The breathing pattern, as I've already explained, uh, in my previous slides that yes, it's like a balloon pump, how you breathe very easy. So deep inhalation, deep exhalation, you know, or coordination of the breathing pattern can actually relax your muscles and, you know, the oxygen content of the, the myo, uh, you, uh, what you can say, hmm. the muscle contraction relaxation pattern is very smoothened out when you breathe well. Mom and baby classes, obviously, I like to take this kind of classes. I have, I'm have i certified into um, antenatal and postnatal uh, physiotherapy as well, um, pregnancy-related issues. So what I, what I do is like uh, I try to educate my new moms that do not give excuse of just having a newborn and I don't have time to attend to my health. You just use that um, issue into something positive that you use your baby or you, as a prop, you know, you actually move around with the baby in a nice coordinated manner so that you can uh, get connected with your baby as well and you are attending to your health as well. So at the same time, you can actually benefiting the small baby. In a neuroscience, we actually take, I'm a pediatric neurophysiotherapist, so I always take care of uh, you know, baby's health also. So this kind of swinging motions can cause a lot of um, um, good activity, brain activity in the kids. And they actually are enrolling themselves to for the mom's fitness, right? So it's a good connection formation. Um, yeah, um, so benefits of Kegels. Everybody has heard, uh, heard about the Kegel uh, who has devised a exercise protocol for strengthening of pelvic floor muscles. And uh, he said that the contraction on holding it for uh, 10 or 20 seconds is beneficial. Um, and you have to repeat that cycle for two to three times. The benefits of Kegel exercises, not always, you know, the strengthening part is so important. So I, I actually touch, touch, touch based on different aspect of those muscles. So relaxation of the muscle is also important. I always believe that length of the muscle is so much important to have a good strength of the muscle. If you do not have a good flexibility of the muscles, how are you going to have this kind of good coordination? It's when, when their muscles are tight, they're dysfunctional. They're not, they're not listening to you. So probably just strengthening is not useful. But again, so strength only when there is a weakness point and you're strengthening the muscle, it actually improves your sexual response uh, recover the physical stresses and uh, stress and childbirth and all those other things like vaginal muscle toning. You know, it's like going to a gym and, you know, attending to your muscles and, you know, getting more fibers there. So it starts looking nicer and it tones up. So, yeah. And then there's a lot of sensation, you know. So orga or orgasm is based on this good pelvic floor health as I always talk about, because the neuronal supply, like what you feel out there is also uh, get, get, gets corrected because of the good nervous connection. I personally like electrical stimulation down there because the sensations are not healthy there when you have a dysfunction. So any tight muscles cannot give you a good sensory supply, right? So, or any weak muscles doesn't have a good, uh, neuronal connection or what if you are 
post pregnancy the sensations are going haywire you know so to just get it to normalize this kind of electrical stimulation actually helps it's an intra vaginal or intra rectal uh, stimulation with the electrode and it normalizes the sensory pattern if you have pain or uh, less of sense sensation or sometimes it's good to get a grip over the muscles and uh, again um, yeah i think that's it for electrical stimulation how about sacral plexus stimulation you know so there are different ways of uh, stimulating the sacral plexus so that the dysfunctional uh, neuronal system around the bladder gets normalized then there are vaginal cones i have seen in my practice that uh, so many times uh, this kind of devices works very well it's like a biofeedback it's like a feedback it's it's telling you there is some object and you need to hold there you know a lot of hollywood movies are focusing into it i um i should not name it them but yeah i have seen it in a lot of movies and maybe this is a very uh, popular product uh, if um, celebrities are using it and there are different um uh, size of cones and there are different weights in there so that you can actually make them uh, stronger uh then we have the treatment tr treatment protocol so treatment of the physiotherapy paradigm can include a lot of uh, things like external and internal soft tissue mobilization myofascial or trigger point release visceral manipulations how you massage the abdominal area or the back area or the glute area we train that uh trigger point release heat and cold, cold uh, to increase or uh, increase the level of you know uh, circulation and cold uh, therapy to reduce the inflammation electrical stimulation deep tissue massage all those things the big take away what i like to give you is keep your exercise pretty simple you know if you can do exercise in standing don't bother lay down and do there are multiple exercise can be done in laying down position where your pelvic floor which is like always facing down is corrected and it's facing to the side and uh, there is there are no gravity stresses on it so just keep it simple like few activities in laying down position can actually give you more leverage to work on the muscles think about those muscles mental imagery like just close your eyes and think about like i can control my bladder and it actually benefits look looking is so much important if you are like uh, i always give example that you cannot cook blindfolded so you have to look you have to smell you know you you have to involve yourself into looking so that you know what what is happening at that area how tight those muscles are or how asymmetrical those muscles are or what is happening in is it inflamed is, is it red or something like that you know breathe breathe in a coordination manner and then feel those muscles okay feel means touch and see that what's happening with them they're atrophied they're shrunk or they are uh, not activating very well their what's their feel like and you will get to know that when you improve your capacity or when you get better how different they start feeling you know so when you touch that area you get mentally connected to the area so it's always good to get connected so this is my biggest take away from the today's presentation and i like to combine the, everything together to have a holistic approach so i am a neurophysiotherapist i am pelvic floor physiotherapist also brain to base you have to start combining because they it's like a you know center release it's like a uh, the the whole health of the body it's not just one point that okay it's not like a mechanic that you send that area and just get it fixed and you know you get the home delivery you have to think about top to bottom how may i help you in this covid 19 situation now uh, the clinics are not physically working but i'm there online uh, i'm taking patients online i'm uh, tele rehabilitation is helping me to have one on one session i would like to talk to you and uh, know what's your issues you know and we'll start correlating with them and we will definitely come up with some treatment plan so there you are and uh, thank you very much for your cooperation and your support and giving me your uh, such a valuable time so i'm all, i'm planning to come up with a practical session where i'm going to work out with pelvic floor uh exercises to relieve incontinence we'll we'll be starting to join hands and we're going to work out
soon. So to book an appointment, I would like to welcome you all and your questions are also welcome right now. So that I would like to answer you guys uh, if you have any doubts about my presentation. But thank you. Thanks for your time.